You're listening to The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. Thanks to Concordia University, Wisconsin for your support of The Coffee Hour. You can find out more about Concordia University, Wisconsin at cuw.edu. Live Uncommon. The Consortium for Classical Lutheran Education Conference 23 taking place at Concordia University, Nebraska this summer, July 18th through the 21st, right around the corner. And we have some of the speakers, some of the presenters from this conference joining us today. The Reverend Robert Paul, Headmaster, Memorial Lutheran Church and School in Houston, Texas. He's also presenting on culture, cultivation, and the administrator's role. Pastor Paul, welcome back to the Coffee Hour. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Looking forward to learning about what you'll be presenting on. And also joining us today, Matt Rivers, parent and volunteer instructor in music at Faith Lutheran High School in Plano, Texas. He's presenting on teaching hymn composition to high school students. Matt? Welcome to the Coffee Hour. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Well, both are exciting topics that I'm looking forward to learning more about. I I know Sarah's excited about hymn composition. Absolutely. I don't know why I can't say <laughs> hymn composition. It's the N in hymn that makes me want to say composition, composition. but that's not the right word. Composition. Not, yeah, no. As, as, a, as an educator myself as well, I, I'm just excited about both of these topics. So let's start with Pastor Paul and what you'll be presenting on before we get to that. Pastor Paul, what is... What is a headmaster? What does a headmaster do? What's your role at Memorial Lutheran? So headmaster is a term that got resuscitated recently and usually refers to a pastor who's an administrator. But we have headmasters in our classical Lutheran schools who are not pastors and sometimes aren't men either. But headmistress doesn't get a whole lot of traction. So so usually it switches back to principal. And the role of the headmaster is very similar to the role of the principal in terms of being the chief administrator, often the one who has to have the final say on discipline. But where headmasters have been pastors, they're also in charge of the spiritual life, the, the, the culture of the faculty, the direction of the school. And you'll find many headmasters today are associate pastors. You're presenting at the upcoming conference about culture cultivation and the administrator's role. What is, let's start with culture, what actually makes up a school's culture? Well, a lot of things traditionally can make up a school's culture. You could talk about the constituents, like the parents and the faculty and staff and the students and the congregation. Ours is a a, a school that belongs to a congregation as opposed to say an association or a homeschool or something like that. I'll borrow a little from Joseph Pieper though, who in a leisure, the basis of culture actually points as a Roman Catholic back to the mass. And for us, we can point to the divine service that the real cultus, the worship of God is the foundation of the culture of a school. And you'll find in most classical Lutheran schools that this is done by having daily chapel where the whole faculty, staff, students, and in many times parents are gathered around word and sometimes sacrament on a daily basis in order to seat the foundation of a culture, not in a tagline, not, not in a, I don't know, safety or, or something like that, but rather in the word of God and what that does for the, the daily life of the parents, the faculty, and the students. What does an ideal culture look like for a school in your, from your perspective? Well, the, the health of the culture, sort of in the same way as a congregation, comes from the foundation on the Word of God and the primacy of the Word of God in the life of all of those constituencies. My presentation is mostly going to focus on some anecdotes on how we've strengthened parent culture, especially since COVID. You know, our, our school, as many schools, Lutheran, traditional and, and classical have you know, grown tremendously in the past few years as people flock from public or other private options. And parents are looking for steadfast teaching in how do you raise your family? How do you have devotions at home? How do you deal with all the things that the world is throwing at you? So a healthy parent culture, a healthy faculty culture, and a healthy student culture Balancing them is difficult, which is why, thankfully, at our conference, there will be a roundtable discussion after my presentation led by another principal on how do you balance all those different concerns and cares. My presentation focuses mostly on the culture of the school and how parents are involved in it and find support and growth from it. 
What are some of the ways that those relationships can be built between, you're talking about all of these different categories of people, the stakeholders involved in what builds a school culture. How can those relationships be built so that this culture can grow stronger in based on the word of God and in the worship of God? Well, you've got sort of the built-in things like faculty meetings and classes where you're teaching students and chapel. At our school, we've added a monthly, a few years ago, a monthly coffee with the headmaster where we take up a topic, usually an article. And since COVID, our usual monthly attendance is anywhere between 20 and 40 parents with coffee and kolaches and whatever the topic might be. More, they let me do more talking than they probably should. But, but that, that monthly gathering is a, is a great sort of cross-section of whether Lutheran families, non-Lutheran families, older student families, younger student families, that's been one thing that's been incredibly successful. And the second is an outgrowth of that, which we call Classical Home, which is a monthly parent sort of support group asked to be started by parents after one of the coffees with the headmaster. And that's more roundtable, throw topics up on the board. I try to sit in the corner instead of stand up front. And, and that's been a very healthy, the word is silly, but safe place for parents, again, across the spectrum, Lutheran, non-Lutheran, kindergarten, ninth grade, to be able to ask questions about how do you parent in a way that's consistent with what the school is doing. I think the key there was kolaches (laughs) along with the coffee. That was the key. Yes. Makes the difference. (laughs) Definitely. For those who haven't experienced kolaches before, get to Texas and Mm. have a few kolaches and some coffee. Go visit Pastor Paul and the the, the good folks at Memorial and you'll understand why this is so important. Yeah. <laughs> we, Pastor Paul, what will we, what will attendees learn in your session at the Consortium for Classical Lutheran Education Conference taking place at Concordia University, Nebraska? They will learn that you will never have a perfect culture except in heaven and that, that the culture of the school is always a work in progress where two Right. One constituency may be well taken care of at a certain time, but that throughout the administrator's time in a school, his or her goal is to constantly facilitate those good gifts for the purposes of taking care of the culture and all the constituencies in his or her care. Very good. Well, there is so much to learn at the Consortium for Classical Lutheran Education Conference taking place July 18th through the 21st at Concordia University, Nebraska. Now, I understand registration is full, but if folks want to think about next summer, Pastor Paul, how can they start making plans and learn more about CCLE? They can pay attention to the website where our eventia post, if we continue with that platform, will be up in the conference booklet. The next year's conference should be announced pretty soon. That's been something that our executive director, Mrs. Anna Martin, has been very keen on making sure everyone knows the location and date. And I'll, I'll let that announce at the conference and in the, on the website. But all information is on ccle.org in the most up-to-date fashion for parents, teachers, pastors, homeschoolers, classical education enthusiasts to know all uh, the upcoming events and exciting things that are coming from the CCLE. Very good. Well, I know Sarah is excited to talk about teaching hymn composition to high school students. We're going to do that in a little bit. First, I want to introduce another guest joining us now, the Reverend Philip Fischerberg. He's at Holy Trinity Lutheran Church in Walnut, Illinois. He'll be teaching on teaching Latin and other languages the Lutheran way. Pastor Fischerberg, thanks for joining us today. Great to be here. Pastor Fischerberg, tell us about how the Lord brought you into classical Lutheran education. Through a couple of different routes. From my scholarship in the 16th century, this is the way our Lutheran reformers and their successors taught the youth of their day and trained them. And also, my mother-in-law is retired from the homeschooling company Classical Conversations. So I married into it as well. It's always a good way to to get into something that's very beneficial for you and your family. Let's talk about languages. Why are Latin and other languages important today? And what do we gain when we learn a language like Latin? Languages are important because they open up a new culture that we don't have without. 
you can enjoy Mexican food or music or going to a fiesta. But without the language, you really don't connect with the culture on a very deep level. And especially with Latin, it's not a culture you can walk down the street and find. But there is a tremendous well over thousands of years of riches written in Latin that are available only as you go to the language and dive into them. Now, what if you find yourself in a position where you want to teach Latin to students, but you haven't studied Latin mm-hmm. yourself? We're going to talk about that in just a moment with Pastor Fisherber, and we'll be talking about teaching hymn composition to high school students in just a moment. You're listening to The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. <laughs> At Concordia University, Wisconsin, we believe you were created for a reason, to use your God-given gifts to help others, to live a life of self-sacrifice in a me-first world, to live a life that's uncommon. Whether you're taking one of 50-plus online programs or learning with us in person on the shores of Lake Michigan, you'll be equipped to make an uncommon impact. Learn more at cuw.edu. Concordia University, Wisconsin. Live uncommon. Welcome back to The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. Today we are talking with presenters from the Consortium for Classical Lutheran Education Conference that's taking place at Concordia University in Nebraska, July 18th through the 21st. We are talking with Reverend Philip Fischerber of Holy Trinity Lutheran Church in Walnut, Illinois, about teaching Latin and other languages the Lutheran way. Now, Pastor Fischerber, you pointed out the benefits of learning a language that opens you, opens you up to a whole new culture and so many other things you can learn by learning another language such as Latin. Now, what if you find yourself in a position where you see the value of learning Latin, but you yourself as a teacher, as a parent, have not learned Latin yet, but want that to be a part of the curriculum for your students, for your child? What do you have to offer parents or teachers who want to include Latin in their curriculum, but haven't had that, haven't learned it themselves? First off, that there's no ideal, perfect way to teach a language. Doing anything is better than nothing. So don't be concerned that you haven't studied it, that you're not a master of it. You're allowed to have questions, too, even when you're the teacher. So... Don't be scared of Latin. Don't be scared of having to tell your students, I don't know. And secondly, that there are lots of resources and methods for doing this if you're not trained in Latin. One of the things that the 16th and 17th century Lutherans were really big on was polyglot books for teaching students different languages. So you had the small catechism in Latin, German, Greek, and Hebrew. Students probably knew German, probably Latin as well. Greek and Hebrew were there so that they could look at familiar texts, the Ten Commandments, the Lord's Prayer. You know what these say. And so if you have them in Latin, you can look at it and figure out what's going on in a much easier way than picking up a Latin textbook and trying to just flip through and read it cold. So what will participants learn in your session at the CCLE conference this year? First off, they'll learn just how innovative and impressive Lutheran education was at the time of the Reformation. These were some of the greatest educators of all time. Melanchthon is known as the teacher of Germany, but many other Lutherans deserve high titles in the same area for their incredible contributions to teaching, many of which are superior to lots of what's done today. And then we'll also look at various suggestions from them as to how to put this into practice based on your students, your own ability level, 
so that you can give a high quality language education to students, even if you're just learning it yourself. Our next guest, Matt Rivers, is a parent and volunteer instructor in music at Faith Lutheran High School in Plano, Texas. And he'll be speaking on teaching hymn composition to high school students. Matt, tell us about your path to becoming a teacher of students at Faith Lutheran High School in Plano, Texas. Certainly. So my undergraduate and graduate education was in music performance. And after that stage of my life was over, looked for ways to be able to contribute not only in the church, but also personally out in the, in the community. And one of the ways that presented itself to do that a few years ago was as a volunteer instructor at, at Faith Lutheran High School in Plano. And so I began by teaching a music theory course uh, for the kids there. And that was an introductory course, very basic things, harmony, voice leading, all, all the sorts of things that go into that. That expanded into a semester-long course on the work of Johann Sebastian Bach and, and music that he wrote, specifically the great choral works. And at the time, I didn't realize that those would be two excellent prerequisites for hymn writing, and they, and they turned out to be. So that's where we ended up this past school year. I taught hymn writing with my wife, Christy Rivers, who's the fourth grade teacher at Faith. And she worked with our students. We had three of them, three high school students. And she taught the, the poetry and end of things, I guess you could say the words, and I taught the music, the harmonic and, and melodic composition elements. I totally want to take that class, not going <laughs> to lie. <laughs> Actually, all of those classes, they all sound great. So what is it about hymns? What makes hymns different from learning or teaching other kinds of music that students may encounter in their daily lives? Well, if, if you ask Bach what he thinks about music that doesn't give praise to God, it, it's going to be rubbish. If it's not pointing to God, then you don't need it. There's plenty of music out there in the world that, that does give glory to God and does a good job of doing so. But it, it's certainly in the minority of what you might find if you turn on your radio. Uh, and so we want our students certainly to be filling their heads with the most excellent and most beautiful music that's possible. And we thankfully, we have a large corpus of that available to them. But we want them to understand that music is, is a gift from God, as Luther would say, and that we should utilize it to, to give glory to God. And, and it's a wonderful instrument to do that. And so we, we want them to, to use it for that and, and not for, for the ways of the world. Okay, when I read the title, Teaching Hymn Composition <laughs> to High School Students, I thought that seems like an arduous task. Mm. What can happen when we set expectations high for high school students. Writing hymns does not sound like something the average high school student might do. Oh, absolutely. And when we jumped into it, there was a little bit of hubris on our part as instructors. And we thought, well, let's see what we can get away with and what might be possible. And <laughs> because of that, we adjusted the deliverables for the course to be reasonable. So for example, all we wanted from the students in the first semester was to be able to look at a hymn out of the Lutheran service book and be able to analyze it. Tell us what's happening with the text here. Diagram the poetic meter. Take the harmony and, and the melody part and, and be able to articulate using numbers and, and theory terms. Provide a full analysis of a hymn. That was the deliverable at the end of the first semester because that's what we did during the first semester is twice a week, and we met twice a week, we would take two to four hymns out of the hymnal that we thought were excellent examples of composition. And we took them apart, everything about them, all of the different elements that, that, that made them a hymn. And we wanted the students to understand those components so that they could begin to think in terms of a process and think in terms of what do I need to be able to put this together? What's my recipe? And identifying those components and being able to articulate what makes them good, good examples of doctrine or theology or, or melodic writing so that they could put those things in their toolbox. And when it was time to start taking baby steps and making those things happen on their own, they knew what that looked like. And that's not unlike other educational principles or, or other approaches in, in other fields. You want to look at how the masters are doing it and then start to mimic that before you can start to create on your own. I feel like this is a great exercise for anyone to do to just take a look at the, at the hymnal and really to analyze the hymns that we love because you get so much more out of them if you study them in a devotional manner or even just in an academic manner of, of understanding the hymnody that we sing and really digging into that. Now, you mentioned that you do the music, your wife does the poetry. How do those two facets of hymn writing 
work together? And why do you have to learn both sides of this to be a somewhat successful hymn writer? Well, I would argue that you don't need to be a master at both to be able to gauge in this exercise. So that's kind of like myth number one in, in writing hymns. And, and you say, well, I have to be able to write this beautiful poetry and then marry it to this gorgeous music. Some of the great hymnists in our Lutheran history I go all the way back. Some of them didn't write any text that's their own, and some didn't write any music that, that's their own. There are hymnists working today in, in the Synod that, that don't write their own music. They collaborate with others. And really, if you flip through the hymnal, you'll see a lot of the words and music are, are different people. And that's a wonderful thing. So some people have, are gifted in, in one way, some in another. But primarily, it's going to come down to understanding those things, the components. I'm not as gifted as my wife is with language and, and her ability to put, to put words together in a beautiful way. She would tell you that, that she wouldn't be able to do what I do with the students in terms of creating melody or harmony. So part of it's identifying what you, how you can contribute, understanding that not everybody can do everything. And, and we saw that in our students as well. Some were better on one end, some were better on, on the other. One thing that we would have liked to have done was have them collaborate, have one write the music, have one write the text. And they helped each other as the course went on through the year. But this is something that is more possible than people realize. And that's one of the goals of the presentation is to demystify the hymn writing process a little bit. It's daunting to sit down at the piano and say, I'm going to write a hymn today. But if you, if you think about it just like other tasks that people do, like making a cake or changing a tire, once you understand the process and the things that need to happen, the mystery kind of comes off of it. And you say, oh, okay, I think I can do this. And you start to try a little bit and it becomes less, uh, less intimidating. Although changing a tire might not sound <laughs> as pretty as writing a hymn. When it's the, maybe it will. I don't know. Matt, what were some of the outcomes from your class and the students? What were the results that the students walked away with that after the, the class? So we wanted them to have confidence to do this in the future. We wanted them to develop a love for the, the corpus that we have of, of the hymnody, but also to know that they can also contribute to that. We're fortunate to be living in a time where a lot of young people are starting to develop skills and being able to contribute to maybe a Lutheran renaissance of sorts. Artists, writers, theologians, musicians. And what a wonderful time to see that start to happen. And so we want our students to have the confidence to contribute and engage in that as, as well. So in terms of actual product, I suppose, each of the students, we wanted them to get to a point by the end of the year where they were able to compose their own four-part multi-stanza hymn. They had the choice of, of theme or season that they wanted to write for, and that was going to be the main deliverable at the end of the course. And all of them were able to complete that. We will feature the music from the class in our presentation at CCLE, and we're looking forward to being able to do that for the students, two sophomores and, and a junior from our class. And looking back at what we thought we would try to accomplish, we didn't want to set out and write our own hymnal in a year, but certainly being able to have the students contribute a hymn a year seemed like a nice thing to be able to do. So we were glad that we made it to that finish line. Outstanding. So much to learn, so many benefits from collaborating, coming together for a conference like this. Pastor Paul, I want to come back to you and talk a little bit more about the, the collaboration that happens through CCLE and how teachers like Matt and Pastor Fishber and you and others who maybe are new to classical Lutheran education, what they can gain through that collaboration that happens at CCLE. So our conference started as a three, two and a half day conference. A couple of years ago, we added a pre-conference that had some introductory material. And so many people came to both that now the conference is three and a half days. And so the introductory material, what is classical Lutheran education? how do I implement it, tends to be on the first day. But a lot of the how do you do it gets interwoven throughout, throughout the days of the conference. The conference was the bread and butter of our organization. But thanks to the involvement of Mrs. Anna Martin, our executive director, we are now going to start having a resource library for schools available through the CCLE website within the next few months in such a way that Schools and home educators can look at different ways to work together with those who have gone before us. How do I implement this or that curriculum? Or from a school perspective, how do I, if I like the culture that's come from faith and what they've been able to inculcate in their students, how do I copy that or 
introduce that to what I'm doing at my school. So the conference is the chief way of collaborating, but with the resource library coming online within the next few months and future projects like curriculum, as well as local conferences in, in schools, sort of a smaller one day opportunity in local areas, say in Texas or Wyoming, where we're concentrated. There's plenty of opportunity for people who are new, people who have been in it a while, to continue to work together with the CCLE. You can learn more about the Consortium for Classical Lutheran Education by visiting ccle.org. Our guest today, the Reverend Robert Paul, Headmaster Memorial Lutheran Church in School in Houston, Texas. Pastor Paul, thanks for being our guest. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. And the Reverend Philip Fishber of Holy Trinity Lutheran Church in Walnut, Illinois. Pastor Fishber, thanks for being our guest. Thanks. Wonderful to be with you. And Matt Rivers, parent and volunteer instructor with Faith Lutheran High School in Plano, Texas. Matt, thanks so much for being our guest today. Thank you. You've been listening to The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. The Coffee Hour with Andy and Sarah is a production of KFUO. To support The Coffee Hour and KFUO Radio, visit KFUO.org. You can also text KFUO to 41444 or send an email to gifts at KFUO.org. And you can call us at 800-844-0524. KFUO. Christ for you anytime, anywhere. Anywhere.